All right, so here's our subsurface. And remember that we have in between all of our sand grains here, we've got pore space. And in the Vados zone, what fills that pore space? Yeah, there's air and water. All right, and at some level down here, some undefined level, here is our water table. And beneath the water table is the saturated zone. Okay, <clears throat> so, ooh, came back. Um, let's, let's, Let's do something right now and let's work towards a proper definition of the water table. Um, so to do that, we actually need to, to work backwards a little bit and think about what, what, what is pressure? Yeah, it's force times area, all right? So, um, you know, I weigh a certain amount, all right? That's a force. When I stand on the podium, I'm exerting a force on the podium. That force spread over the area of the podium is the pressure that the podium's feeling, all right? And it, it would literally be my weight times that area of the podium, all right? So pressure is force times area. P is force, actually it's per unit area, sorry. Force divided by area. All right, now we use, a, we use a, a, a couple terms a lot in hydrology um, and, and they basically have to do with reference to atmospheric pressure. So one thing we need to realize is that at everywhere There are, on, at the Earth's surface, there are atoms of atmosphere and they're bouncing around and they exert pressure. So PTM, PATM is atmospheric pressure. And atmospheric pressure becomes the reference for many things. So we often refer to pressure in two ways. One is called gauge pressure, All right? And what gauge pressure means is what is the pressure relative to atmosphere? So if I have a positive gauge pressure, that means the pressure wherever I'm at is higher than atmosphere. If I have a negative gauge pressure, and this is really important, it just means that my pressure is negative relative to atmosphere. There's action, so we can, so gauge pressure, we'll call PG.
And that's relative to atmosphere. I'm gonna make that G better because it's horrible. Okay. The other one is absolute pressure. And this isn't relative to anything. It is just, it is literally the force divided by the area, force per unit area. Okay, gauge pressure can be positive or negative. All right, something can have lower pressure than the atmosphere or it can have higher pressure than the atmosphere. But absolute pressure can only be positive. Well, it can be greater than or equal to zero. The minimum absolute pressure is zero. That means there's no, at, it's a complete vacuum. There's no atoms pressing on anybody. It's zero pressure, all right? Okay. So, the technical definition of the water table all right is defined as the location where the pore pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure This matters a lot, and there's a reason why this is the specific definition. Another definition that we might think would be probable would be like, well, it's the zone where all the pores are saturated and full of water, all right? But that's, I'm gonna show you why that's not the case here in a second. The true definition is the point at which the pore pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. So what would the gauge pressure be at the water table? be zero, zero. That's the point at which, so it's relative to the atmosphere. So gauge pressure of zero means that the pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. That's the definition of gauge pressure. So <clears throat> we're gonna talk a lot more about this, all right? But pores, uh, small diameter tubes, essentially, water will climb up, all right? And that's because water's sticky stuff. We'll talk about that more in depth, don't worry. But that process is called capillarity, all right? And that's how trees work. That's exactly how trees work. They have these really tiny, tiny tubes and the water climbs up them. All right, that capillarity pulls water up from the water table. So there's actually a zone up here that's fully saturated. All the pore space is full of water. 
We call it the capillary fringe. All right. And this is in the capillary fringe, our pores are 100% saturated. So how do we distinguish that from the water table? Well, the gauge pressure would be less than zero or the, pr or the fluid pressure would be less than an atmosphere in those pores. Okay, it's fully saturated, but the pore pressure is below the atmospheric pressure. And it's this capillary action, it's the fact that small pores attract water, all right, that pulls the water up from the water table into the saturated zone. So here's the capillary fringe. So this is the basic anatomy of our vadosone. We have the vadosone, we've got the capillary fringe, and then we get to the water table. Um, okay, so what I want to start thinking about now is, is starting to think about the fundamental um, one of the fundamental questions of, of groundwater, and that is um, trying to back out the water budget. And to do that, we're gonna sort of step up to the surface and think about the hydrologic cycle and, and, and focus in on the Vado zone and what happens here. So, um, let me, Come down here and I'm gonna redraw. How big is all that? It's pretty big. I can make my drawings a little smaller, I think, which will help me. Um, all right, so let's go back and focus in on our Fado zone. And here's my water table. Down here. Let's put a, uh, let's put a lake in here. or a river, whatever case may be. And uh, once again, my river is very small and disconnected from my water table. And I've drawn that twice now and that never happens. So for the record, that's just, we're just staying in Missoula the east side of Missoula Valley where the world is weird. Um, okay. So 
I'm gonna say one of the one of the biggest questions in any groundwater study is always how much water enters our groundwater system. So to think about that, we're gonna we're gonna have some more definition. So first of all, um, I'm assuming everyone here has learned about the hydrologic cycle at some level, and I don't want to get I don't want to bemoan it, but we do need to make some strict definitions here. So first of all, what's the major input to any terrestrial hydrologic system? Where does the water come from? Yeah, precipitation. All right, so let's draw us a little cloud. Happy little cloud. And it's, it's raining. which at least this year occurs year round in Missoula. All right, so that's precip. Okay, what can happen to this precipitation once it sort of gets here to the land surface? What happens to it? Okay, so there's two different processes. So, so let's start with this stuff. What's the stuff that runs across the surface called? Yeah, it's a really creative name. Overland flow. And it's kind of a unicorn. It occurs occasionally, rarely. For some reason, people for a long time in hydrology have decided that it determines the way a watershed responds, even though we never see it. So it's a mythical beast. It does occur occasionally in very specific settings, but we still, we still allow it to exist. Okay, so overland flow, what else can happen to it? So it goes into the ground. What does anybody know what it's called when it goes into the ground? We have a specific definition. You don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to be right. Yeah, so when it starts to seep into the soil, it's called infiltration. Right, it infiltrates the soil. So this stuff up here infiltration. I'm gonna put some roots here from our tree. Okay, so precipitation hits our ground. It can, it can run off right off the ground or right over the ground and overland flow. Some of it can sink into the soil. What else can happen to this, to this precip? Sure. Some of this rain can fall or snow can fall right on our tree. It's intercepted. So that's interception.
Okay, what else? Sure, so all this stuff here that's infiltrated the soil, where's the, where's the tree get its water? From this infiltrated soil water. So this uptake by water, this is transpiration. Okay, what else can happen? Yeah, this stuff evaporates both off of the rivers and, and off of the overland flow. We get straight up evaporation. Any other things you guys think could happen to this soil or sorry, to this water? Let me ask you this, what happens? What do you think happens to water that infiltrates the soil? What does it do? Okay, so, so I certainly agree, Finn. I think that some of it could be moving towards the water table. What else could be happening? Yeah, it gets, it gets transpired. Another thing, let me actually, I drew this on a flat slope, but what if I was on the side of a mountain? What if I was on Mount Sentinel? Do you think it would just, the soil water would just go straight down? So it's not a clear uh, answer even, but in general, especially on hill slopes, water can move along the hill slope through the soil zone. And we call that soil flow. All right, so we get some along sort of soil parallel flow. And then as, we talked about some of this water also moves downward to the water table. Okay, so as high as groundwater scientists, the most important thing here, all right, is the, and because groundwater is the largest body of fresh water, usable fresh water, this is of course the most important of all these fluxes. I'm just kidding, that was a joke. But, um, but it is a really important flux for groundwater hydrologists. It's this water that makes it down to the water table, all right? This is the fraction of that precipitation that enters our groundwater system and replenishes it. And this, this gets a special name. So does anybody know what this is called? The fraction of precipitation that makes it down to the water table. This is recharge.
Okay, and recharge is, I'm gonna say one of the top. Top, it's one of the big three. Top three big questions in groundwater hydrology. Top three question. So if fundamentally we wanna know how much water we can extract out of a groundwater system or uh, um, how a groundwater system is going to respond to extraction. Like you could imagine knowing how much is coming into the system is really, really important, all right? So we're always trying to figure out what's the recharge. All right, so here's your chance. To, uh, to make your make your print on the groundwater science field how do we how do we measure recharge how do we how do we measure that if I tell you that I want to pump 10 percent of recharge in the Missoula Valley so that I'm running a sustainable groundwater extraction program how are you going to decide or how are you going to measure how much recharge we get So we could, so potentially we could look at the water level in the aquifer. That's a very good idea. Okay, so I'm gonna write some of these down. These are all great ideas. So one water level. Uh, and I'm gonna put a caveat on here, Finn, because in order to measure the water level, we have to have a place to do it. So I'm gonna say in wells. Is that okay? All right, water balance. And we'll talk about more about what that is, but uh, <clears throat> essentially we could try and and balance the water budget here and take into account all these different processes and come up with how much is entering the recharge system or the groundwater system. Any other ideas? Yeah, so, so let me just say this. First of all, good job. You guys have identified the number, the two top ways that we try and attack this problem. And then we get, we're gonna talk about why these are the fundamental problems with some of these and why we don't really often know the recharge rate. And then we can get really fancy. So like what we do in our lab is we actually age date the water and you could look at the gradient in age in the water and that'll give you the recharge rate so so there's lots of fancy ways to try and get at it but but you've identified the the two top ways that we do it here's here's a couple problems first of all when we look at water level it's a great it's the be, maybe the best way to actually measure recharge rate here's the problem you can only do it where you've got a well all right, and so all you know is the recharge rate at that one spot. And, um, and that's its fundamental limitation. So it's really, it's a good measurement. But spatially, um limited it, 
it also works good in areas like Montana, where we get all of our recharge in one go, basically in the spring. But it doesn't work good in areas like, uh, well, in the east, for example, where they get rain all the all year round, and we they don't see massive fluctuations in the water table. It stays pretty steady. But it's good. Water balance is its primary and principal utility is that it allows you to look at large areas. So it's spatially distributed. But as we'll see, there's lots of uncertainty. However, it's by far your first, your, the most common first estimate to try and get at the recharge rate is to look at the water balance. So this is the most common and easiest first step. We don't have to drill a hole. We don't have to go measure water levels. All right, we can try and just estimate recharge. Okay, so let's let's focus in on this water balance method and let's think about what we need to know. First of all, let's derive a water balance equation that would allow us to back out recharge. Let's think about what terms we need to know. And then let's talk about how we might come up with them. All right, so I'm going to, uh, Make a new section here, uh, water balance. Of the soil zone. So the way we often try and derive the recharge is to look at the water balance of the soil and isolate the recharge. So let's just for ease of, of visualization, I'll put our soil zone here with some grass or shrubs and roots. All right, and um, this time I'm gonna try and draw a hydrologically plausible stream setting. So I'm gonna draw the stream before I draw the water table. Oh, see, it's already not plausible. Gosh. All right, here's the water table. Here's the stream elevation. And this is just the bank. Okay. Let's think about the water budget for the soil zone. So we're gonna kind of focus in here on the soil. And the, well, we're, we're gonna focus in on the soil and the sort of surface, the uh, surface just above the soil, all right? So we've got this cube of the soil here that we've isolated. All right, so what are, uh, all 
And here's rain coming down from a cloud. All right, so <clears throat> my main input, all right, my fundamental input to my soil system is what? Precip. And then if we think about ways that that um, if we think about what happens to that preset, what were uh, let's call this uh, output. What were things that happened to that precip that we identified? Yep, so overland flow, I'm gonna use O for that. What else did we have? Evaporation, transpiration, what else? Okay, so I'm gonna call that soil flow. And use S. So let me draw some vectors here. At, this is P coming in, O is leaving, S is leaving. Uh, E is leaving, T is leaving, and R is leaving. Okay, so this, um, Two things I want to illustrate here is that anytime we do a water balance, the, the trickiest bit is deciding how we draw the boundaries to our system and then deciding what's coming in and what's going out. So here our boundary to the system is like just above the soil zone to just above the groundwater system. All right. And so we're just above the soil zone, we're just above the groundwater system and the things coming in, well, it's precip. And then there's all these different ways it could be leaving. All right. So now we're gonna write a water balance. And the water balance is once we have sort of defined our boundary, all right, and identified all the, all the things coming in and coming out, then it's pretty easy. So here's what we say. The change in storage um, how am I gonna differentiate soil flow and storage? Yeah, interflow and uh, infiltration both have an I. Um, I'm just going to call it ST. The change in storage in my soil zone. So that's the change in how much water is accumulated in my block of soil. All right. It's equal to what's coming in minus what's going out. Right. Easy. It's just a mass balance. So precip is coming in and then it's minus all these other things. Minus O, minus E, minus T, minus S 
and minus R. Okay, so now remember, we're groundwater hydrologists. R is what we're after. All right, so I can just rearrange this equation, right, and solve for R. The easiest way to do that is just add R to this side and subtract delta ST over on this side. And so I can come up with my recharge is equal to P minus O minus E minus T minus S minus delta S T. Okay, so this is a way we, if we knew all these terms, we could easily measure, we would know, we would quantify what recharge is. All right. This is the, you know, the water balance to isolate recharge. Now, I think you could maybe see, but let's talk about it and formalize that in our brains. What, like, let's, let's just say, which one of these you think, well, how do we measure each one? So how do we measure precipitate? We're gonna get way into measuring precipitation. Let's, let's actually skip that one for now. Um, but let's say, I'm gonna say this one, we can actually kind of measure. How would we measure overland flow? I mean, we could go out during a storm, right? And, and go look and find overland flow and measure it. And we do that. That's how we know whether the unicorn exists or not. Yeah, Finch. It's the same, but overland flow is just moving. Uh, but puddles, that's that surface, that surface ponding is what we call it. But it's 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 water that's ponded at the surface. Yeah, you can. You can go measure it. It's re you could imagine that it's pretty intensive. It's not something that uh, like after every rainstorm, there isn't an army of hydrologists going up Mount Sentinel to measure how much overland flow there is. So maybe, but I would say that, you know, we could still measure it. How about the flow, the soil flow? How would you measure that? So we're going to get in, you know, I wouldn't expect you guys really to be able to answer this one, but we'll get into some methods to try and measure it. But one like, you know, sort of direct measurement is you go on a hill slope and you take a backhoe and you dig a big ass trench. All right. And then all the water that comes out of the soil comes into that trench. You funnel that trench through a weir and you measure how much water's moving through. All right. That's how you can measure it. And that's how it is measured in the field. But again, you don't see anybody driving a backhoe across Mount Sentinel after every rainstorm to collect the soil flow, all right? So again, it's pretty hard. Maybe even more problematic is how do you measure the change in the storage in the soil? 
We'll talk about that, but that's literally how much water is in the soil. Again, it can be measured, but it's hard. So already we can see some problems with our water balance and that is that like it's like overland flow, soil flow, change in storage, all of these are gonna be, they're down in the soil and they're actually pretty hard to measure. So the way you deal with that is you just say they're equal to zero. <laughs> Not really, but in some locations, like if we were in flat, like if we're in a flat area, right, where ponding would be more expected, but not flow, then we can say, I think overland flow. Also, people who have gone out and measured overland flow, we know it's pretty low. It's just not a big component unless you're raining really hard. So in most cases, overland flow, we can say is equal to zero at least in flatlands, all right? Um, soil flow, again, if we're in a flat location, you can see that a lot, so the predominant amount of groundwater hydrology in its origination was done in the plains, all right? And I would say mountain groundwater hydrology is, you know, a, really a new field almost. Um, but we might say that if it's flat, all right, that we could at least expect this soil flow to be small. Um, and we can make a really big assumption here. And that is to say that if we were to look over like a full year, the change in the soil, soil storage isn't big. It might change a lot appreciably over a day, but when we average those changes out over a full year, the soil zone approximately has the same amount of water in it, all right? Again, it's an assumption. All of these are assumptions. So we often make this assumption. So we assume O is small, short-lived, so we ignore it. Often, this isn't, none of this is a, uh, hard and fast. And we're gonna look at a lot of different methods, but you know, we could assume overland flow is, is small and it's short-lived. And we assume that uh, soil flow is the same. It's small and short-lived. And we assume that the change in the amount of water in the soil is roughly zero, equal to zero over long time periods. And when we do that, we get this relatively simple equation, R is equal to P minus E minus T. Now, I want, to, I want to put a star on this. This is a really common way that a first order estimate of recharge is made. You'll see this equation 
used in a variety of studies. In order to do that, you've had to make all these assumptions. All right. We do have to do this all the time in science. And, and these assumptions are often reasonable, but we need to understand and think about how they might affect our answer and when and where they're applicable. So for example, if I was trying to use this particular method in the mountains where soil flow and overland flow could be pretty significant, it might not be a great way to estimate recharge, right? It's still used because we can measure precipitation kind of, but, um, but it might not be the best. Okay, so <clears throat> let's just use this for now as our sort of really common way that people measure recharge. And what I wanna do now is talk about, okay, so now let's look at these two term, these three terms and how do we measure them and how do they vary over the landscape? So let's take a five minute break. If you need to get a drink of water, use the restroom, whatever, go outside. Um, and when we come back, we're gonna start talking about precipitation, how we measure it, how it varies, and how we might try and, you know, look at it over big spatial uh, areas. Okay, so uh, how do we measure precip? Okay. Normally, uh, I agree, I agree. Uh, this is definitely a way we do. Um, and it does, it just measures the volume of water in a certain cylinder of a known size. Um, any other ways you think that we might measure precip? Yeah, so normally, you know, in Missoula during winter, the precip doesn't fall all as rain, right? It falls as snow. And snow is a little different. It, it won't just fill up a graduated cylinder. So there's lots of different ways to try and measure snow. One is to put a bucket full of antifreeze. And when the snow falls, it hits the antifreeze, it melts into water, and you just weigh the difference between. Uh, as you add more and more snow and you get more and more liquid in your bucket. So we can call that a, a weighing gauge. We'll look at how some of these things look here in a second. So for snow in particular, you know, it's really difficult. So one of the other ways we measure uh, snow, we'll look at these, it's called a snow pillow. And the idea is that you have a, on the ground, you put a big square and uh, snow pillow. The idea is that you've got this uh, sort of square pillow. All right. Uh, and it's full of antifreeze. And um, the more snow that's on it, the higher the pressure is in that antifreeze inside the snow pillow. 
So what a snow pillow measures is the pressure And then you, you can convert that to the weight of the water in the snow that's sitting on top of your pillow. It's, it's basically just another kind of weighing gauge. Uh, any other ways we might measure precip? Satellites, I don't know whether we get, I'm trying to think, we may be able to get some, some returns from satellites that measure actual precip. We use satellites a lot for weather, right? I don't know about precip, but, but you bring up a really big thing. If I wanna know if it's raining for my bike ride home, I don't look up the local rain gauge system. What do I look at? What is my weather app looking at? Radar. They look at radar and that radar isn't from satellites. It's from the Death Star sitting up on top of point six above Snowball. And, and, you know, at least in a rich country, you know, like US or Canada or somewhere in Europe, we have systems of these radar uh, units all positioned all around the country. And we can look and see at least near populated areas where there's precipitation, all right? That radar is not a direct measurement of precipitation. It's based upon returns of a radar wave, but it is a way that we can measure precip. Okay, so <clears throat> these are the most common ways we measure precip. Um, and in particular, all of these ones we measure precip at a point. All right, we get the value of how much rain fell at the location of that gauge only. So one of the principal problems with precipitation is thinking about what does that point measurement mean? So how uniform is precipitation? If I have a point measurement, how uniform, how, how uniform is that measurement? How big an area could I say that that measurement is, is useful for? Yeah, again, it depends on where you're at, but we're in Montana and we have extreme variation. So as an example, Missoula has about the same precipitation as Santa Fe, New Mexico. We're dry, we're a desert actually, we're semi-arid, we're desert down here. But if I drive 45 minutes to the top of Lolo Pass, there's red, 
feeders growing, which require a Northwest, very humid climate. All right. So it's really variable, extremely variable. And in fact, when you're walking around town today, I want you to look up at Mount Sentinel and I want you to see how sharp the line is between the forested area and the grassland and understand that the difference between a forest and the grassland there has something to do with this precipitation and evapotranspiration budget. In fact, it's completely dependent upon that. And the line between forest and grassland, you couldn't make it more sharp if you went out there with a saw. It's incredible. So our variation in precipitation is really high. All right, and so our fundamental problem in, in water balance is deciding what the heck do I do with these point measurements? So what controls, What do you think is, a, is important for controlling the variation of precip? What are, what are characteristics of the landscape or weather or whatever that might be something that would allow us to think about how precipitation varies? Yeah. Probably the biggest. Maybe one of them. What else do you think controls the variation of precipitation? Yeah, so the prevailing winds and the, so one of the things we, we use there is this term aspect. And aspect tells us how that landscape is oriented towards the prevailing wind. So a great example is Lolo Pass. The Idaho side of Lolo Pass is pointed into the pr prevailing winds. They get a lot more snow than the Montana side, which is pointed away from the prevailing winds. So aspect is really important, 100% agree. Um, what else do you think might be important? Yeah, I guess I would argue that topography is really encompassed by elevation and aspect. It's like a, but, um, Yeah, let's let's um, try to think about. There's a there's actually is a term for this, and I can't remember it at the moment. I'll put topography for now. Uh, I'm going to put topographic position. And again, this is a little muddy because I would argue that elevation and aspect are part of topographic position, but here we mean are you sort of within a larger mountain chain or are you at the front of a mountain chain or on the back side of a mountain chain? Okay, what else do you think? Yeah. Distance to the ocean is a pretty big deal. If you live right by the ocean, probably you're going to be wetter. So distance to water body is a big one, to surface water body. But we're going to say distance to ocean 
That's really important. What else do you think is important? Well, let's think about that. Two rainiest spots on the planet are the Amazon and the temperate rainforest in Alaska. One's hot as hell and one's not. So temperature, temperature is really important for the water budget. And we're gonna to get to that for sure, but it doesn't have a huge effect on precip. Yeah. Okay, so there's some climatic forcings that we could think about for sure, absolutely. Um, and I would say that those influence sort of greater weather patterns. And one way, so climate, let's put climate down, climate zone, or, uh, and we'll, we're gonna talk a little bit about climate versus weather, but uh, climate zone and drivers. But I think a good example potentially is Let's look at, um, or think about this. Um, we can think about places that are really hot and dry, let's say the Middle East, right? And we think of places that are really hot and wet, like the Amazon. Why, why are there hot and dry and hot and wet places or even along our west coast here, like San Diego, it's right next to the ocean, but it's dry in Los Angeles. Those are desert towns. But, you know, Seattle, it's right next to the exact same ocean and it rains all the time. Yeah, so it's due to large scale, large scale atmospheric circulation. All right, we have really dry desert areas and we have very moist areas. And really it's latitude that determines that. So weather's, weather and precipitation is this really dynamic and interesting system that determine where and when and how much precipitation we get. And all of these things are important, all right? And as an example of just how variable this is, I just wanna look at a model. And uh, this is modeled precipitation, all right? And the way PRISM works uh, is they take all the gauge data that's available to them, all the precipitation point measurements, and they fit lines to the precipitation with elevation, with aspect, with distance to the ocean, with latitude, all right, all these main drivers that you guys identified, they find the functions that uh, locally best fit the precipitation data, and then they map them onto each landscape position using that landscape's elevation, topography, and uh, you know, distance from the ocean, latitude, all those things. So this is what the distribution of precipitation looks like nationally. This is annual average over the last 30 years, all right, precipitation. Um, so uh, we're, you know, right here uh, 
at the tip of the Bitterroot Valley intersection of the Nine Mile and Bitterroot Valley. Here's Missoula, all right. Um, and you can see that, especially in the Western US, it's really, really variable where, when, and how much precipitation we get. Out in the Eastern US, not so much. Look, it's pretty like a, a single point measurement here kind of works for a big portion of a state, right? I bet you they have by far more precipitation measurements in that state than we do here, All right? Like one measurement, you know, one measurement in, in Michigan here would, would do most of the state, but I bet you Michigan has, I don't know, a hundred times more precipitation measurements than we do in Montana. And we have very variable precipitation. Um, so I think the main thing I want you guys to realize here is that precip is extremely variable. And so deciding how we're gonna come up with that P for our, for our water budget is really hard especially if we have a large area over which we're trying to do it. So if we're, you know, aquifers, as an example, there's an aquifer uh, system that underlies pretty much all of Eastern Montana, all right? A single aquifer system. If you're trying to understand recharge into that aquifer, you got to think about all of Eastern Montana you know, how do you, how are you gonna come up with a precip value over that whole thing using these point measurements, knowing how variable it is? So there's a variety of ways we do that. And, the, and you know, the, today a modern hydrologist is gonna use something like PRISM. Uh, there's a few other of these gridded data sets, probably the most, I'd say the one that I use is probably the most uh, people fight over this. So I don't want, I, I don't, I don't want to hedge, but PRISM, there's another one called GridNet produced by folks at uh, University of Idaho that actually uses PRISM and then radar and then weather forecasting models to estimate precipitation. Those are the common, those are the ways you guys are going to do this. When you need to know how much precip falls in a basin, a common hydrologist, a, a, a hydrologist today is going to go, they're going to get one of these gridded data sets. They're going to extract that gridded data set for the time period that they want it for. Um, but what I want to do is think about what I want to look a little bit under the hood and do this more manually so that when you do this in the future, you know what your computer's doing. All right. And in order to do that, you need, we needed to use GIS and lots of coding tools and we're just not there yet. So, all right. So let's think about how we might, knowing how variable precip is, how are we going to take a series of gauge data and turn it into a amount of precip that's coming into a watershed. Um, let's see. So we got 15 minutes. I think I will save the the demonstration of this. Now let's get into it because this will allow you guys to uh, get to work on some homework. Um, and we'll get as far as we can get. So let's um, go back here and let's um,
Okay, so a really common thing that hydrologists have to do and that you guys are gonna have to do as part of your homework is to try to think about a watershed. All right, and what do I mean by a watershed? What is a watershed? Yeah, so let's say this is our outlet. Any precipitation that falls within this area will drain to this one outlet. That's what a watershed means. So rain, any rain that falls within this area drains to this point, my outlet. And really what it means is this is the most downhill point. I can't, I don't go uphill at all in order to get to this point. That's what a watershed means. It's all downhill to this point, the outlet. Um, okay, and commonly I'll have, you know, let's say we're really lucky and I've got some precipitation measurement in this basin. Uh, so I'm just gonna use some random numbers. We're gonna call this, We'll say this is uh, two, this is 2.5353 and six. So I have these point measurements. Remember, I got them from a rain gauge. Uh, they are the measurement of precip at that point. I also know how variable precip is. So how do I, I wanna calculate, oh, also let's, let's do a few things first. Uh, because we live in the US right now, we are cursed with the imperial system and blessed with the imperial system. Okay, so we're gonna, you guys, as part of having to learn hydrology and potentially practice hydrology in the US, you get the bane of the most archaic units ever invented. All right, and you're just gonna have to deal with that. And if you wanna publish in an international journal, you're gonna have to turn it into units that sane people use. And you're just gonna have to get used to working with insane units and moving back and forth between sane and insane units. It's just the way it is, it's life. So when I get a measurement of precip, what is it? Like when someone reports the amount of rain we got yesterday, what did they, what, what is the measurement they give you? Yeah, it's like we got yesterday, we got half an inch of rain or whatever, right? That's the measurement they give you. What What is that? What does that mean? Yeah, would measure that length, right? So it's a length. If I want to know a volume from a length, what do I got to do? If I want to know the volume of water in that cup, what do I have to do? What's that? Yeah. So precip is generally measured in length. But as hydrologists, we're gonna to have to get used to moving between volume and length. That's just part of what we gotta do. And in order to move from, so volume, oh, I'm gonna introduce a symbol that I use. For volume, I'll put a cross through my V. That way it distinguishes it from velocity or whatever other V we might have. 
All right. So volume is my precip length in length times the area. All right. Okay. So that's just like a little aside. We, we measure precip in length. Like if we wanna know a water budget in volume, we're gonna to have to multiply the precip by the area, right? Um, okay, so this is the common problem. You've got these measurements of precip and length from point gauges. How are you gonna calculate? How would you tell me how much precipitation fell in this watershed? What are some ways you could you could think of to to come up with a the the value of precip that fell in this watershed? You could accept our outlet is precip and then all these other things are subtracted out of it. So evaporation, transpiration. We'll talk about that. You're not, it's, it's a good idea. The outlet tells me a lot, but I've lost a lot of water. Turns out that evaporation and transpiration account for, our, it's one of the, besides precip, it's the biggest flux of water in and out of a watershed. So we'll have lost a lot. So how, what else? Finch, you had your hand up. Okay, so we could, so that is a method. So we could just take all of these numbers and average them arithmetically. Now, this is done. It is definitely a way that, you know, you wouldn't be totally wrong to do something like this but there is an implicit assumption in this method. What do you think that assumption is? If I just took the average of all of these and then multiplied by the total area of the watershed, what, what there's a hidden assumption in there. Yeah, you're assuming that each one of these measurement stations represents an equal area of the watershed, right? It's not a terrible assumption, but we know that like we could maybe do better. So, <clears throat> so there are other ways that we might try and account for the dis unequal distribution of measurements or unequal sort of yeah, unequal distribution of measurements or unequal uh, distribution of rainfall. So all of these amount to basically trying to figure out what area or a reasonable area over which to apply this measurement. And they're all a class of area weighted average. So we could just take the arithmetic average and essentially what we're doing is saying the area for each one of the area for each one of these measurements is the same. But there are lots of other ways to try and come up with an area weighted average. So <clears throat> the first one and the one I'll try and demonstrate quickly uh in the last few minutes here is called the Tyson polygon weighted average. And it's just a way to try and draw even polygons around each station, all right? And then that polygon gets called the area over which this station applies. So <clears throat> I'm gonna do this first. I'm going to 
just draw some dotted lines that connect my stations. And these, these lines are just the straight line distance between each station. And it's sort of nearest neighbors. And this is a technique that's gonna require an eraser. So this should all be done in pencil because you're going to go and have to iterate several times. And then, so I draw all these connectors and then I draw a bisector line. So that says like halfway between this guy and this guy, I'm just going to eyeball it. That looks like right about there. Halfway between this one and this one. Looks like right about there. Halfway between this one and this one looks like right about there. And so I'm just going to draw these bisectors. Oh, that's a terrible bisector right there that I just drew. It's definitely not halfway through. Okay, now to create the polygon around each station, I connect the bisectors. And I basically just go straight from the border to this one, and then I connect these So now I've got a polygon. I, and it has some area A1, and it's got a precip P1, right? And then I connect I connect these polygons. This always gets a little. Oh, I've already made a mistake. Luckily, I have an eraser. This has got to go here, here. It's got to go over to here. Here. Here, here. And so what I get here is a series of polygons that are sort of the boundaries between each polygon or halfway between the stations. All right, and I know I got a class coming, so I'm just gonna, I've now got, you know, N number of polygons, all right? Here I actually have one, two, three, four, five, six polygons, all right? But you'll, you'll have some indeterminate amount of polygons. And the Tyson weighted average says, says that my average precip is equal to the sum 
I equals one to N. So this is my N polygons of the precip sub I times the area sub I. over the total area. So the arithmetic average one I'm just going to write up here would be sum of p sub i divided by n. That's just the arithmetic average, right? And then this whole thing would be divided by the total area. I'm just going to call that a sub t here. OK, so we'll talk about other ways to do this interpolation, but this is what we call an area weighted average. We say each one of these precepts is weighted by the area around which we're gonna say it applies. And we've used just these, we're just equally bisecting the stations and we're saying each station applies over half the distance between it and the next station, all right? Uh, or last quick question, what length or what unit is this average precip going to be in? What do you think? Yeah, it's going to be in length because this is a volume and we're dividing by an area. We're going to end up with a length. So this is an average precip length. All right. Okay. Done for today. I told you, don't expect to get out early very often. I will get Moodle up and running. So um, I, you have class right now, don't you, Finch? I'll try and add you, but first I have to get a Moodle shell running. So the first thing I'm gonna do is email you guys all a syllabus. What else was I gonna do? Something else, I'll think of it. <laughs> 